We're looking at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. This is one of the great chapters in the New Testament. One of the huge chapters in the New Testament. Some would say that it's the most theological passage in the New Testament. But here's the thing. It was not written for that reason. This passage was not written... This isn't Paul's way of saying, look how theological I am. It was not written for that reason. There's a reason why Paul pens Philippians 2. And it's not to do with theology. It's to do with an issue in the church which Paul deals with. Now what is this issue? Because Paul loves this church. They are a fantastic church. Generally speaking, this is one of the finest churches that Paul planted. The problem, and the first hint of this problem is in Philippians 1, 27. He says that you stand together in one spirit. There's a hint of it there. Now, they sent a man called Epaphroditus to go and be with Paul in his prison. And most scholars believe that, of course, Paul is always asking, how's the church getting on? What's happening? Where is it at spiritually and all this? The Epaphroditus basically explained that there was some disunity. It wasn't a major thing, but there was some disunity in the church. There's a hint of Paul dealing with this in the first chapter, but in chapter 2, he deals with it full on in the most glorious way. Typical Paul. So much so that what he talks about is almost beyond comprehension. But he's dealing with an issue. So we're going to go straight into it. Philippians 2. Now look how he starts this. It's really interesting. Therefore, if there is any encouragement, any encouragement in Christ, in the church, if there is any. Now, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find a church where there's literally no encouragement whatsoever. There's always encouragement going on between the body. Paul is saying, if there's any encouragement, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any koinonia of the Spirit. Remember, we looked at that word last week. If there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion. So he begins by saying, I want you to look at the things in the church that are actually working. Now this is something that Paul talks about later on in this. Because we're living in days where many Christians have battles going on in the mind. And so Paul is going to later on in this letter talk about how to control your mind. How to make sure that things don't overtake your mind, that your mind is swirling and thinking about all kinds of things and they're getting blown out of um, perspective. So he begins by saying, if there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation of law, if there's any fellowship in the Spirit, if there's any affection or compassion, make my joy complete. Now here, he goes back to saying the same thing that he says in chapter 1. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. So he's, he's repeating chapter 1. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do you see what he's doing here? So look, it's like this. Uh, somebody said to me in the week, you can't industrialise family. I love that. It's just stayed with me. Church is a family. You can't industrialise family. In family, you are always going to have things that happen. That's the very nature of family. Things happen. And of course, they flare up, they go down, they go away, it moves on, another family member starts. And that's family, generally speaking. That's how family is. Everybody knows that. There's no, it's particularly if you've got a big family, there's never a dull moment. So here he's making, he's saying, if there's anything in it worth looking at, look at it. 
Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And then comes the issue. This is the issue that Paul knows about. He says this, do nothing, do nothing from selfishness or selfish ambition. Do nothing. And then he says, or empty conceit. Now, conceit simply means thinking too highly of oneself. That's, that's, that's all it means. So Paul now launches into it. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Nothing. And when it comes to that, friends, we have to check our own heart. And to do that, you have to have relationship with the Lord. You have to go away like uh, David did in Psalm 139 and ask the question, search me, O God, and see if there is any wicked way in me. Because Paul says, if you do anything out of selfish ambition, you're going to have disunity. If there are people that are moving in empty conceit, in other words, that are thinking too highly of themselves, you're going to have problems. It's always going to happen. Now he moves from this to the solution, and the solution is mind-blowing. And I am not this morning going to even attempt to describe to you what Paul is saying here, because you can't plumb the depths of it. But he says, with humility of mind, humility of mind, not thinking you're more important than somebody else, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests. Now, that doesn't mean that we all have personal interests, folks. That's obvious. Of course we do. But it's saying here, don't just look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. What is Paul, as the apostle, as the church planter, most concerned about? He's concerned about unity of spirit and unity of doctrine. It is absolutely essential to Paul to have unity of spirit and unity of doctrine. And he says, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, because if you do, there's going to be disunity. But also for the interests of others. And here it is. Here is this great passage. Now, this is the tragedy. This is the tragedy of Philippians 2. Is that people that have a, a theological persuasion miss the context. They miss the reason why this is given. They jump straight to the theology. They get lost in the theology and they miss why Paul is saying it in the first place. What is it he's saying? What character and mind ought we to have? Because that's the only reason why we have this next part. Paul isn't writing this to say, Hey guys, didn't I just give you a real download in theology? Did it blow your mind? Did I blow your mind? That's not why it's written. He says, have this mind or have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now this is really important. What is the character of God? What does the character of God look like? Because if you have a warped view of the character of God, you're going to be warped. The character of God is the character of Jesus. If you want to understand God, you have to understand Jesus. If you want to know what the mind of God is like, the character of God, look at Jesus. And so people get wrapped up in this whole thing of, of describing God and flying around and going down all sorts of avenues. Look at Jesus. 
and you'll know the character. Look at Christ's attitude and you will know the character of God. So what was his attitude? It says of Moses that Moses was the most humble man that ever was, but there was one that was more humble. This is the very character of God. This is the mind that Paul is saying, Philippians, you've got to get this mind. This is the mind I want you to get. This is the attitude I want you to get. This is God. This is, do you know this? God is humble. How on earth can God be humble? That's incredible. It makes no sense, but he is. Jesus says, learn of me. I am meek. Come and be yoked to me. I'm meek. Let this mind be in you. Let this attitude be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Then it launches into the depths. Oh, what depths. Who, although he existed in the form of God, in other words, who, who was there from eternity, with, with, whose outward appearance perfectly corresponds exactly to an inward reality. His outward appearance perfectly, exactly responds to the inward reality that Jesus Christ is God. Amen. He is God. In the form, that's where we get the word more from. But in, in the Greek, it doesn't just mean a shape. It means the inward reality, the exact character of God. For although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard. God, equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Then we have what the theologians call the kenosis theory. That's what they call it because the word empty. Empty there is, we get the word kenosis from it. And this is where the problems start. The problems start because there are, hundreds, there are thousands of denominations in the world today that view Jesus, all of them view Jesus slightly differently. Now it says here that Jesus, Jesus himself is equally God as God is. He is very much God. Now, as we'll see in a minute, it goes way beyond that. But he emptied himself. He emptied himself, taking the form, the, again the word morphe is used there, the form of a bondservant. Now here's the thing. Although Jesus emptied himself, he never emptied himself of his deity. Do you understand? He emptied himself of his privileges. So when Jesus came to earth, as a young man, everywhere he went, they weren't saying, Hail God, oh, hail God. No. He came as a bondservant. But he, in essence, he was still fully God. You ever, people use the uh, example of the prince and the pauper. The prince, the king that leaves his throne, the prince leaves his throne and he dresses up as a pauper and the pauper goes to the throne. And of course, he emptied himself of all of his privileges, but he's still the prince. Nothing's changed. Now, why, now I know you get this. I, I know you get this, friends. But there are so many people that don't. They, and and the, the problem is, when you don't believe that Jesus is both fully God, and we'll come to this in a minute, and fully man, he cannot be our saviour. Now, why is Paul saying this? He's saying this because th there are people whose attitudes are higher than they should be. And what he's doing is he's saying, look to your example, look to your saviour, look to his attitude. Not even to Moses, but to Jesus. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. In men. Incredible. Let me show you something that you've seen a million times before. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son 
And she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. God is with us. Now, I like listening to John Lennox when he's doing, he's doing lectures to physicists, atheistic physicists. He's a lovely man, a wonderful man. And very often they, they will ask him, how can Jesus possibly be both God and man? Very often atheistic uh, physicists will ask that question, how can he possibly be both? And John Lennox says this, he says, this is what I like to do. I like to ask them, what is energy? And they'll talk about what they think energy is and eventually say, no, 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 I'm asking you, what is energy? And ultimately, physicists have to admit that they, they don't fully understand what energy is. They don't. And then he'll ask, well, what is consciousness? And of course, they'll all start talking about what consciousness is. But he'll ask again, but actually, what is consciousness? And eventually, they have to come to an understanding that we don't really know what it is. But we know it's there, and we know it works. Do you understand? We know it's there, and we know it works, but they can't actually describe what it is. It's just too deep. It's just too profound. It's beyond us. It's beyond us. So Paul is beginning to describe how, how part of the triunity of the Godhead, the only begotten from eternity, left heaven as God became a man who was in this life fully God and fully man, but took upon himself the very nature of a bondservant. And atheists, they struggle like mad. They just don't get it. But they're not the only ones, are they? They're not the only ones. Have a look at John 1, 1 just for a minute. Again, I know you know these things. But in John 1, 1, and you've, some of you will probably have read this to Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm sure. And you've read it to Jehovah's Witnesses and they will say to you, you are absolutely wrong. They'll go on to say that the Greek tells you that he is not God, he's a God with a small g, and they will stand by it. And listen, this is so important. There are very few Jehovah's Witnesses that ever leave that faith. Very, very few. There are very few. There, there are those that leave, but there are very few that convert to Christianity. Normally when a Jehovah's Witness leaves the faith, they are so damaged by that cult that they lose all faith in faiths. Now, so what they do is, when you talk about John 1.1, 1, 1, they say, oh, no, 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 that's not what the Greek says, because that's what we've been taught from day one. It's not what the Greek says. It's not what the Greek says. But this is what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing has been made that has been made. Even the context itself tells you that this, the person that's been talked about here is the creator God. Yeah. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not comprehended it. Let's go to verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, uh, but the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. When we look at the scriptures, we realize that what Paul says in Philippians 2 is absolutely correct. That Jesus is not just God, he's also man. Yeah. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. How can that be? How can he be both God and man? So the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, he isn't God. There's the answer. He isn't God. That's what they'll say. But then there are many others that will say, well, actually, he's only God. And he's not man at all. And there are, there are, there are extremes on both sides of this that say, well, he, he's only God. There are those that say he's only man. But that's not what the Bible teaches. 
The Bible teaches all over the New Testament that he is both human, he's man. He has emotions. He's, he, you see him where he's weary, you know. He is hungry. He has the same problems that we have because he's man. But he's also God. He's not 50% God and 50% man. He's fully God and fully man. And that makes no sense. It just makes no sense. And people try to explain it. They try, but you can't. And I've always said this, you know. All it makes me want to do is worship God. That's all it makes me want to do is just worship him. Amen. These things are too lofty for me. You can understand it to a degree. You can understand it to a degree. But then it's like, whoa. I'm in the middle of the river here and it's just sweeping me away. I'm out of my depth. These are deep things. Man, these are heavy lyrics. I once, in my cocky days, because I was an electrician, and so I, I, I thought, I'm going to do something, and it really wound everybody up in the electrical wholesalers, but I did it anyway. So I went into this electrical wholesalers, and uh, there's all these electricians coming to get stuff for the jobs that they were going on. So they're all queued up. It's like a captive audience, isn't it? So I said, lads, can I ask you all a question? I said, I said what is electricity? So there's just like this stunning silence of, what are you talking about? We're all electricians. I mean, what, what an absolute insult that you're asking us, what is electricity? So they start to try and, and describe what electricity is. And so I'd say, well, I, I understand that. I understand that it's a flow of electrons from one atom to another. However, I'm asking you the question, what is electricity? And there comes a point where they cannot tell you what electricity is because electricity is so profoundly mysterious, you cannot explain it. So, I went to my Uncle Les. Now, my Uncle Les, and this is the only bragging right I have, so please let me brag for a while. My Uncle Les was at the, the very, very top of his game. He was headhunted by all the companies around the world. He was up with the very best, the Bill Gates of this world. He knew them all, all of them, Apple the lot. And he was one of a handful of people that put together the first microprocessor. The guy was an absolute genius. So there I was trying to grasp the deep things of God as a Christian. And I wanted to ask me Uncle Les. Uncle Les, yes, and he loved to explain things. And he was brilliant at taking the very difficult things and making them simple. So I said, Uncle Les, what is electricity? So my Uncle Les said, look at me stunned. And, and the first thing that they do is they give you the, the host pipe analogy, you know? That you, you've, got, uh, that you've got all this water in a hose pipe and if it's pushed that much at one end and it's instantly pushed that much at the other end it's not travelling through but it just pushes through those electrons going from one to another but they all move instantaneously and so on I said, no, I understand that Uncle Les but what is electricity? So then he goes to another level and he starts to talk about the, what's going on inside of it I said, but, uh, no, uh, Uncle Les, I, d I, I, I understand that but what is electricity? <laughs> and, and at that point he said to me he said look <laughs> he said we can measure it and we can use it and that's all I need to know <laughs> and the guy was a I mean, the guy was an absolute genius but the, what I'm trying to say to you is there comes a point where you just can't plumb the depths any further. It's just so mysterious. When they discovered the Higgs boson, the God particle, it, it just flagged up another 20 questions. They didn't get any further to understanding things. It just became more profoundly strange to them. And so it is with the Godhead. So it is with Jesus. So it is with Christ being both fully God, which is a completely different set of equations which we know nothing about, and fully man, which dwells here with the, with the, with the four forces of the universe, with, with electric, uh, electromagnetism and gravity and the strong and weak nuclear. There he is within the confines of this earth, but he's also fully God. How can these two things be? How can they be together? The answer is, we don't know. <laughs> but what we do know is, it works. Yeah. Amen. 
That's what we know. It works. You see, if Jesus wasn't fully God and fully man, he couldn't have died for us upon the cross. The Bible declares that he's both. Does it explain the mechanics of it? Does it try and get... And listen, there are theologians that argue and argue and argue about the kenosis theory. In Philippians 2, well, is he this, is he that, is he 20% God? And they, it goes on and on and on. And it never stops. Because there comes a point where we don't have that capacity. We have to be like David. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain it. I cannot attain it. And that's the kenosis. This is what Paul is saying in Philippians 2. I want you to have this mind. I want you to be humble. I want you to understand that there are some things that are so beyond understanding that it just makes you want to worship me. And that for me has always been the case. When I look at the Godhead, I just want to worship him. It's what he does to me. Let's go back in, in, and look at Philippians because it just gets better and better. It's so beautiful. Step down. He stepped down from heaven as deity and he added humanity. He added humanity. He became fully man and fully God. But he became as a bond servant to serve. We see it, don't we? We see it when he's washing the disciples' feet. And, the, and he says to them, if you don't let me do this, you can have no part of me. I have to serve you. I have to wash you. It's my nature, it's what I am. I am love personified. Yeah. I must wash you. Yeah. So it goes on, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself. Do you see what Paul's saying here? How can God humble himself? What has he got to humble himself about? <laughs> it makes no sense. How can God humble himself? What is, he, what is it that he's haughty about? Nothing. <laughs> he doesn't need worship. He doesn't need you. He's completely complete within himself. Why would he? How did he? What's the point? He humbled himself by becoming obedient. Christ had a choice. Christ had a choice by being obedient. Obedient to what? To the point of death. To what death? The death of the cross. Yeah. Why did he say this? Why did Paul say this to the Philippians? Because the Philippians was a Roman colony. If they were Roman colony, these were Romans. You couldn't crucify somebody that was a Roman, you couldn't crucify them, it was against the law. None of these people would ever have to undergo crucifixion. What he's saying to these people is, he had to humble himself to something that you will never have to go through. Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen, and he used that card when needed. Of course he did, of course he did. Crucifixion back then would take up to seven days. Seven days to die. It was a horrific way of dying. And he, he goes on to tell them that he humbled himself. How on earth does deity humble himself? And how does deity be obedient? How can it be obedient? Because he became man. He came man. He was born into this world. He, and remember when Mary and Joseph are saying, Son, we've been looking for you everywhere. What are you doing? You're supposed to be with us. He says, I must be about my father's business. And they're wrestling with his humanity and his deity. They're wrestling. Even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Have a look at um, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, 39. You know, I... I can only imagine... What it must be like if you're a Jewish person and you start to read through Genesis and you hear the account of Abraham and Isaac going up to the top of Mount Moriah and of course the, the angel of the Lord stops him from killing Isaac and he says to him, God himself 
will provide the lamb. I can only imagine what that must be like for a Jewish person for it to click that God provided us the answer. That God provided for us the answer. It's his provision. It is the provision for the world. For God so loved the world that he provided. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He provided him. And yet he's fully God and fully man. And here we see Jesus beginning to wrestle. And it says in, in Matthew chapter 26, 38, Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Even this, even what I'm going through in Gethsemane, what, even what I'm thinking is killing me. This is turmoil. He was in turmoil. Why would he be in, in turmoil if he was just God? You see? He's fully God and he's fully man. And he's in turmoil. And we're told that no temptation will take, take over us that Christ himself hasn't gone through. How many, seriously, think about this folks. How many martyrs do you think the night before they were martyred were not thinking exactly the same thing? How many? Where they are so full of turmoil. It says that Jesus sweat drops of blood. The stress was so terrible. Even to the point of death, remain here and keep watch with me. What we see here is God's provision. This is his provision. This is his love. This is his character. The very center of the center of the center of God's character is his demonstration of what he did for us upon the cross. That is love. That's God's love for us. That's his character. This is his provision. But Jesus had to be obedient. He had to be obedient to that. And he went a little beyond them and he fell on his face and he prayed. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in such turmoil that you've been on your face before God? Because you've got no answers. And everything inside of you is screaming to, to quit or, or do something different than the, the will of God. You've had enough. You don't want to go any further. Well, Jesus went there before you. And he went there before me. And what he went through was exponentially worse than anything we will ever go through. And he went through it for you. And he went through it for me. And he says, my father, it, if it is possible. But it's not possible because this is God's provision. It's him. It's him or bust. There is no plan B. There was no plan B. There wasn't a whole load of Jesus he's waiting in heaven. Well, that one's failed. Let's send another one. There's one. There's one. And, and he knows he's the only one. And yet in turmoil of mind. Absolutely. Folks, we, what you see here is the humanity of Jesus Christ. And yet he's fully God. Why do you think the devil won't try to make him to turn stones into bread? Why do you think he tried to do that? Because he wanted him to exercise his, his rights as God outside of the remit of the mission. That's right. yeah. That's right. My father, if it is impossible, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, yeah, not as I will. Not as I will. Jesus' will at this point was in conflict with the father. There's conflict. You see, we, 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 tend, we tend to think, you know, because we've read these things so many times, we just see the love of Jesus and he comes and he goes to the cross. No. 
When you see a church that's been planted in the 1040 window, a church that's been planted in a difficult area, you think, oh, praise the Lord for them missionaries, haven't they done well? And we never see the cost. We never see the tears. We never see the humility. We never see the battering and the attack. We don't see any of that. We just see this lovely church that's been planted. We never see the cost. There's always a cost. There's always, always a cost. And here was just this cost keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and he went away again and he prayed the same thing three times and it's recorded in all the synoptic gospels and it's even recorded in John he says shall I not drink from this cup shall I not drink from this cup let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus this is his mind he didn't consider it robbery to be with God. He's folly God. And yet he left heaven. He, he let go of all the privileges of who he is. He stepped into, this, into the body of a bond servant and served yeah. to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This is the gospel. This blows me away. This is what I can't fathom. This is the bit that I am constantly left punch drunk by the love of God. It blows me away. I just can't handle it. I don't know how to contain it. My cup runs over with the love of God because I can't handle it. Nor do I even fully understand it. There's no equation on this planet that's going to that's make sense of any of this. It's unreal, and yet it's real. And it's just like my Uncle Les says, Listen, all I know is this. You can measure electricity, and you can use electricity, and it works, and that's all I need to know. And all I need to know, friends, is that Christ came for me. And the Bible says, by believing in him, I will have eternal life. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Having faith in Christ, you have peace with God. And I remember the day, the hour, and the second when I put my faith in him. And a peace came that I have never experienced in my entire life. A peace that surpasses all understanding. For this reason, for this reason, this is his mind. This is the mind of God. He's humble and lowly and meek. Come and yoke, come and learn of me. For this reason, God, he doesn't exalt himself. He doesn't say, well, right now I'm going to exalt myself. But he says, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. What is the name of Jesus? The name of Jesus is Yahweh saves. <laughs> Yahweh saves. Yahweh left heaven. Yahweh was born as a child. He's fully God and fully man. Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves is the highest name above all names. Yeshua. Yahweh saves. So at the name of Jesus. Now look carefully in your Bible now. Look at what it says when it says every knee will bow. Look carefully. If you look carefully, you'll realize it is a quotation from the Old Testament because that's all they had when they wrote the New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on those who are under the earth. It's in Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. And it's God speaking. It's God speaking. It's God speaking. <laughs> Isaiah 45 verse 22. Turn to me and be saved. This is God speaking. Turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. Right to the ends of the earth. Turn to me and be saved. For I am God. And there is, there is no other. And, and it goes on later on as Isaiah to say, there is no other saviour but me. That's right. Now if there's no other saviour but God, 
then Jesus has to be God. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness. I will not turn back. That to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Where does Paul get this teaching from? He gets it from Isaiah. Who's speaking? God. God. Who is Jesus? He's fully God and he's fully man. He's 100% God and he's 100% man. And listen, let me say this to you. There are times in your life when when the Lord, by his spirit, will impress upon you the parts of the Gospels to do with the humanity of Jesus and it will blow you away. There are other times in your life where the Lord will impress upon you the very deity of Jesus and they'll blow you away. And, and it happens. As you go through life, you see different facets of him. You marvel at his humanity. At other times you marvel at his deity. But never forget this. He is 100% fully God and fully man. It's a mind blower, isn't it? How can that be? Well, the scriptures tell us. The scriptures make it so clear that he is both 100% man and 100% God. And you say, well, how can that be? The physicists say that's impossible. That goes against all laws. It's impossible. Well, it might be impossible to them, but it works. It's the only way we get saved. Do you understand? It's the only way we get saved. Here we see the words of Yahweh. Okay, what's Jesus' name? Yahweh is salvation. What does it say in Philippians 2? He has the name above all names. Why? Because he is Yahweh. Incredible, isn't it? Incredible. There is a conundrum in physics that has been a major, major problem for a long time. And, And this problem is that Albert Einstein believed that one day we would find a theory for everything. Now, what does that mean? It means that they would find one equation that would describe how everything works. And he was convinced. Now, the first thing that they really got to grips with was gravity. Isaac Newton, the laws of motion, and it was a very, very good equation, and it worked to a point. And then along came Albert Einstein, and he gave a much deeper uh, description of gravity. Then along came the, uh, the quantum guys of quantum physics. And they started to discover laws within the subatomic world, the atom, within the atom, that are so contradictory to the laws of the supermassive, the macro world, the, the, the universe, the big stuff, the planets, the suns, the big stuff, The laws of the small stuff are so contradictory to the laws of the big stuff that for the last 100 years they've tried to bring these together. And they can't. They can't. The closest they've got is something called the standard model. And they rave about the standard model and it's an incredible achievement. But the standard model is one equation that fits together the strong and the weak nuclear force and electromagnetism all into one equation. And it works. You see, because they're all subatomic. And because they're all subatomic, they all follow the same very mysterious laws. Gravity at the other end of the spectrum follows completely different laws. It's the laws of the supermassive. 
And they cannot get it to fit. And so for the longest time they've tried, tried to find something called quantum gravity because if they can find quantum gravity then they can make it fit, but they can't. They just can't make it fit. It just doesn't fit. But here's the problem for them. They know that the entire universe exists because, because the supermassive and the subatomic are working together in complete harmony. But they don't know how. They haven't got an equation to show them how there isn't one. So they know that the universe is saying these things are in harmony. That's why we have life on this planet. We have life because these things are in complete harmony. But they haven't got an equation to describe how there isn't one. And so for the last 100 years, they've been trying to find it. And the closest they got is something called string theory. And they're a million miles away. They know these things are in harmony. The physicists know it. One complements the other, but it doesn't make any sense to them. Well, it shouldn't. Well, it does. But it shouldn't, but it does. Well, we shouldn't have life, but we've got life. Jesus being fully God, Jesus being fully man, is like bringing two sets of an equation together that completely contradict one another. How are they to come together? How, I want to know the equation, Lord. Why? Why? Why do you need to know the equation? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend my entire life trying to figure out that equation. Why? I, do you know there was a book in my bedroom before I was saved? Because my grandma had a lot of Christian books, and I kept looking at this book, and looking at this book, and looking at this book, and thinking, and it was simply called, Let Go and Let God. Yeah. And I kept looking at it, and I'm looking at it, and I knew that at some point in my life, I was going to have to let go and let God. Yes. This here has caused a lot of disputes. <laughs> and that's an understatement, right? This is the elephant in the room for the world, this book. They don't like it. The world doesn't like this book. This book that we have in our hands was penned by men. It was penned by men. Jesus said of Isaiah, well, did Isaiah say, my people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It's penned by men, but it's been brought through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is fully God-breathed. What is the Word? The Word is a total reflection of Jesus. Amen. Jesus is fully God yes. and fully man. The Word is fully God and fully man. Men wrote this. We are at the mercy of men that wrote this. Their personalities are allowed to come out. And you see their personalities permeating through. You see their humanity permeating through the books of the Bible. And yet, it is fully God. It's fully God. Isn't that incredible? How can the two go together? How can these completely contradictory, differing things actually partner up with one another and make sense what they do. It's called the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's get back, friends. Let's get back. Why did Paul write this? Because he wanted to be a big theological show-off? No, not at all. Because he wants you to know the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. This is what it says. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the Septuagint in the Old Testament, that is, he's God, basically. He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen to this. This is, this is insane and yet wonderful. Listen very carefully. 1 Peter 2, 5, this is what it says. For there is one God... 
and one mediator. Also between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Amen. The man, Christ Jesus. Listen to this. Listen, please. There is a man in the glory. Do you get that? Do you get that? There is a man in the glory. He's there. He's waiting for you. He is love personified. He died in your place upon the cross. He is your provision. There is a man in the glory. The mediator between God and man sent out into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature everywhere. Send this message out. There is a man in the glory. He ain't just God. He's man as well. Who is worthy? Who are we going to entrust with the title deeds of the universe? Who can we entrust? Axios. Who can be weighed against God apart from God? There is a God man in the glory. And he takes the scroll from the Father. And that tells me that our future is secure. Amen. It's, in, I, I, it's beyond words, isn't it? Isn't it, friends? It's beyond words. There are some things that I don't understand with my intellect, but my spirit's jumping up and down rejoicing. Yes. <sighs> so then comes the application. So verse 12. So then, my beloved. And he loves them. He loves these guys. Folks, you, you have to understand how hard it was for Paul to do what he did. He... Folks, we'll never know until we get there. But we know that there was a... Uh, uh, well, you'll see in a minute. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in, uh, in, as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to work to be saved. It doesn't mean that at all. Our salvation is secure through faith. You can't earn salvation. What it means is this. If you have truly found salvation, you will put your body on the altar. As it says in Romans chapter 12, it's your reasonable service. If you really saved, you'll be out and out for God. That's what it means. And what God has worked into you through salvation, you work out. What God has worked into you, the love of God, the glory of God, the provision of God, you work out. And so what you see so many times in the scripture is you see that we have to partner with him. We have to partner with him. God is sovereign. We have free will and we have to partner with him. He wants us to partner with him. It gives him so much satisfaction when we choose to partner with him. When we choose to obey him. So he says, now I want you to work out what was put in you through salvation. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work to his good pleasure. We're being changed, folks, from glory to glory. That's what the Bible tells me. Listen, I don't know about you. I am not what I should be. I am not what I should be. But I am also not what I used to be. We're being changed. We're slowly being changed from glory to glory. And so you've got one verse here that's saying, you've got to work this out. The next verse is saying, God is working with you here. He's working with you. Why, said Spurgeon, the two darlings go hand in hand. This is, this is the very sovereignty of God and the free will of man working beautifully. What is Jesus? He's fully God. He's fully man. What is the word of God? It is fully God and he's fully man. What do you see within the scriptures? The sovereignty of God and the free will of man. And it works. Well, how does it work? You don't know. Nobody knows. It's beyond our capacity to know. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work to his good pleasure. His good pleasure. You know what it says in Ezekiel 33, 11? 
It says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure in people going to hell. That's not what he takes pleasure in. He takes pleasure when we begin to walk with him. Walk with me, he says. Come alongside, can two be in agreement unless we walk together? Walk with me in this. And in this you'll please me. You will please me. Isn't it amazing? Beyond understanding. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. That in the Septuagint, those words are used for the, for the children of Israel that are constantly grumbling. They're the same words that are used. And by the way, they didn't get to the promised land. God made sure they didn't get there. Because of unbelief, they stopped believing. And he says, I want you to do all things through without grumbling and disputing. Stop your grumbling and disputing. Look at what I've just said to you. Let this mind be in you. He was a bond servant. We've come to serve one another. That's why we're here. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation and whom you appear as lights in this world glory Paul's quoting from from Daniel chapter 12 here you know those at the end of time will be like lights those that lead many to righteousness they'll be like the stars in heaven we shine like lights I heard one person say like this is absolutely beautiful in the same way that the moon goes through lunar phases, doesn't it? So all the way through a month, that it goes from that as tiny little slither and it goes bigger and bigger and eventually it goes away and you've got no moon, you've got a moonless night. So as in, in life, so in the seasons of, 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 of Christ's history, the church has shone in different luminosities. And the darker it gets, the more we need to shine. And the more we need to be in one mind, in one accord. Not arguing about silly things, but looking at the things that really, really matter. The love of God. I need to be able to say to people, God loves you. And he demonstrated it by sending his son. Because honestly, what else matters? Really, what else matters? Holding fast to the word of life, that in the day of Christ, notice that the shining of lights is coupled with the day of Christ. That's Daniel 12. I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. That word toil means to be exhausted. You need to understand. Paul was constantly disappointed with Christians. Constantly. He was constantly thinking, was that all in vain? Was that all in vain? There was a man called Demas who was a brilliant team player. He went the whole hog. He went the whole way. And Paul just simply says this. Demas has forsaken me for this world. Demas has forsaken me for this world. What do you think Paul thought about Demas? He doesn't get into a theological discussion as to whether Demas was saved or not in the first place. He says, Demas has forsaken me for this world. How do you think Paul felt? I'll tell you how he felt. He felt that his work was in vain for that person. Alexander the coppersmith did Paul much harm. He was cruel to Paul. You know what Paul says? Hand him over to Satan. You don't hand unbelievers over to Satan. They already belong to Satan. Alexander the coppersmith did him much harm. What do you think Paul thought about that man? I worked all that work in vain. It was in vain. You can go through, there are so many characters in the Bible that Paul, this exhausted man at the end of his life, must have thought, was all that for nothing? When, he's, when you look at the church of Corinth with its endless problems, he doesn't say they weren't saved. He works with them. He works with them because he loves them. But they did his head in absolutely did his head in the, the Corinthians did and look what he's saying here that, my, that, I, that I will not run in vain or toil in vain in other words stop your grumbling stop, stop your whinging 
Start to work together. Be of one mind so that my work is not in vain. That's what Paul is saying. Are you enjoying us this morning? He says, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, of your faith, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. I'd rather be up there. I'd rather be up there right now. I'm doing this for you. That's what he's saying. A drink offering was poured out both in pagan ceremonies and also in the temple. Along with the sacrifice, there would be a drink offering. And it would be poured out completely. The word for labour there is that Paul was exhausted. He's poured out. Paul had been poured out. And he's saying to this church, work with me here. Partner with me here. Have koinonia with me here. Let your mind have the same mind as Jesus. Well, actually, if you really read between the lines, Paul is saying, have the same mind as me, because I've got the same mind as Jesus. That's really what he's saying. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit, of like, it means of like mind, who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Now we get this romantic view of the early church, and there were so many good things about the early church, but we tend to think that everybody was on fire and everybody was fully committed, and that's just not true. Paul is saying there's only one young man here that, that I can actually trust that has the same mind as me. Now, isn't that incredible? And I hope, if possible, I hope to be a Timothy to my dying day. Yes. I have no... I, I don't want to be a Paul. I want to be a Timothy. I can remember um, my first pastor... I can remember that man trusting the pulpit to me. And you can go back in your life and you can look at amazing moments. When you're getting older and you know you've never had sex before, you think, what must it be like to have sex? It must be amazing. And everybody, teenagers, look forward to that day when it happens. Unfortunately, these days, they don't bother getting married anymore. We all know that. And we have these moments, and sometimes they're very disappointing. Sometimes it just isn't what you think. Well, if I, if I get rich, well, then I'll have this moment in life. Or if I finally have this and I finally have that. I can tell you this. I can tell you this because I've experienced this th on three separate occasions. When you are a Timothy and your Paul is in the congregation looking at you as you preach and he's beaming at you. He's beaming at you because he's so pleased. There is no feeling like it. I remember Brian Downwood taking me down to Bournemouth for 10 years. I used to go walking with him through the fields. Every, we laughed. We, we, we laughed together. And I can remember Brian would always, he'd always say, Timothy, Timothy, he'd say, my true son of the faith. That's how we would always, Timothy, my true son of the faith. And I can remember doing those conferences packed out with people, 500 odd people, and I'd watch him, who was kind of like my Paul at that time in my life, he wasn't perfect, neither was the pastor, nobody is perfect folks, there is nobody that's perfect, but I can remember seeing that look on his face, that he was so pleased, yeah. and there's not a feeling on this earth like it, no. I got invited to preach at a conference this year, I was entrusted with that pulpit, and I watched the guy that invited me. I saw the look on his face. It's incredible. It's an amazing feeling when people entrust you with their pulpit because they know you're of the same mind. That's what Paul is talking about. This is what he wants for you. This is God's will for you. He wants this for you. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth. That means that Timothy had been tested. You realise that? <laughs> Nobody wants to be tested. 
Nobody wants that, but that's a part of it. He was proven, he was tested, and he served with me. He served Paul. He served with him, but he served him. In the furtherance of the gospel, like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. <laughs> you know when you practice a word many times before? <laughs> Epaphroditus, that's it. Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger or, or apostle with a small a. And, and he was a minister to me. And that word minister means priestly. Priestly. So this is what happened. They sent Epaphroditus to help Paul. The Philippians sent him to help Paul. This was his ministry. This was his ministry, was to serve and help Paul. And boy, was he a help to him. A tremendous help to him. And this is what he says, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So get this. They send Epaphroditus, any journey back then was dangerous, any journey. So to go from there to very, very dangerous. Somewhere along the line, we don't know where, this man gets sick. Now there's no indication that he was miraculously healed by the gift of healing here. It's more that he's, he kind of recovered. But this is what he says, for indeed he was sick to the point of death. He was dying. But God had mercy on him. <laughs> God had mercy on him. And by the way, nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does it say that you're not to get medical treatment. Nowhere. We believe in gifts of healing. People do get healed, but nowhere in Scripture does it say don't seek medical healing. For he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him. And not only him also, but uh, on me. Listen to this. So that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Do you understand what... Paul, this whole letter is about joy. You've, you've probably grasped that. This whole letter is about, he's in prison. But this whole letter is about joy. Then he says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. What Paul is saying is, if I go, that's good for me. But he's saying, if, if he goes, that's sorrow, sorrow upon sorrow for me. <laughs> he's basically saying, I don't mind going, but you can't go. I need you. <laughs> If you go, that'll just be sorrow upon sorrow. I feel like that about some of you lot. You know, I'm, when I say some, I mean those of you that are about to pop your clogs. <laughs> I don't want you to go. I don't want you to go, but you know what? I know that you're going to get gain, but I don't want you to go. How selfish of me. <laughs> Terribly selfish. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again you may rejoice and may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because, because he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service. That word risking is the word gamble. Who, li who liked to gamble before you were saved? Who liked to gamble? Some people like to gamble. I've got to say, it's one of the things I never got into gambling. I don't know why. Probably wasn't clever enough to work out the odds. <laughs> but what this tells me about this man is this, that he, he actually took a gamble. Can you believe that? He took a gamble to go and serve Paul and it nearly cost him his life. That's what he's saying. You, you receive this man well. You receive him well because he took a gamble and it nearly cost him his life. What are we willing to risk to serve Jesus in these days? There's a lot of things people are willing to risk. But I'm talking now in the context 
of Philippians 2. What are we willing to risk? Are we willing to risk our pride? Are we willing to risk our pride? Will, are we willing to gamble on losing our pride and becoming servants? Servants. Why was Timothy exalted? Why? Because he had the same mind as Paul. The same mind. You see, friends, very often we'll talk about, well, I'm willing to lose my job, or I'm willing to do this, or I'm willing to go to prison. But actually, some of those things are relatively easy. That's not what's being asked here. What's being asked in, the, in this incredible chapter is this. Will you, will we, will I humble myself and grapple with the mind of Christ willing to lose our pride? Difficult one, isn't it? But here's the thing. According to Philippians 2, the rewards are phenomenal. The rewards are phenomenal. We will be exalted. We won't be deified. <laughs> There's only one. But we will be exalted. All those that humble themselves will be exalted. So let me ask you in closing church, having listened to that chapter and understood what Jesus has done on behalf of us all, that's made such provision on, heart, on behalf of us all, shouldn't we get along? Shouldn't we be of one spirit? Shouldn't we be of one accord? Shouldn't we not let things become contentious? Cancerous? Friends, I'm telling you, there's, there, is, there is a message in here for us right now. For all of us, it's for us. It's for us. Not easy, is it? Not easy. Well, thank you, Lord.